Okay, it's time to keep our class going here. I want you to go ahead and open your Bible to Genesis 3. We're going to start with a question. We've been through all of this. And they, the classes are being recorded. So you can get them online if you want to. Uh, but they all are all being recorded and put online. One of the places that we started in Genesis, and really one of the places that we started in this class, we've been trying to identify what it means to be in death. You know, we started in Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What does it mean to be dead? We went back and we looked at Genesis 2, Genesis 3. We saw what death was there. One thing that came up in Genesis 3, and the question has come back to me again this week by other individual. I think, Mike, you alluded to it in a previous class. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the question was, how do you know in verse 15 that the he listed is Jesus. A lot of people believe that he is human race. But I want to teach you a little bit of something, um, how you can figure things out in Scripture. One thing we don't do very well is that we don't pay attention to verses. We just kind of gloss over them, especially if we're familiar with them. And that's a tragic mistake. You got to pay attention to the words. What you need, number one, you need an accurate version. If you're going to come to a better understanding, you need an accurate version. I've been over these with congregation here several times. And then with an accurate version, you need to pay attention then to what words mean. So the question is, how do you know that he is Jesus? and not the human race. Well, I'm going to give it to you first with that. You don't need to know Hebrew, which the Old Testament was written in. You don't need to know Greek, which the New Testament was written in. Look at verse 15 together. This is God's curse upon the serpent. He said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. He talks about putting enmity between the serpent and the woman. And in the very next statement, what pronoun comes up? He. If we're talking about mankind as a whole, would he call mankind he? What kind of pronoun are we talking about? Singular. singular. We're talking about a singular pronoun. Now I'm going to take it a step further. This pronoun he, out of the Hebrew, it's third person, it's singular, and it is masculine. So we're talking about a he. And there would only be one he coming through the seed lineage of the woman. And that would be, it would have to be Jesus. Because we found out last week, we ended in Romans 5, 12, that through one man sin came into the world and death through sin and death spread to all mankind because all sin. So we're not talking about mankind. We're talking about from the beginning, God already had it in, in plan for the death of Jesus. And Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. And all the serpent did was bruise the heel. He's just giving a comparison. So I wanted to throw that out at first because that was the question that came up. How do you know he is Jesus? And there's no other way to put anything else in there. He is the only he and all of that. All right. 
Now that we got that, any questions, any comments? All right, speak up. Remember, if you got a question, speak up. I want to come back. Let's go back to Romans, if you would. And like I say, you can catch up on all this online. Let's go back to Romans. Romans chapter 5. I just quoted it. But I want to start there today. And we're not in any hurry. Like I said, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna look at what death is, what a person when they're dead and their sins. We're looking at what death is. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 12, let's read it together. He says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so, death spread to all men because all sin. It's a universal problem. Death, what is it? As we, we've been over two weeks. What do you remember death is? Separation. Separation, Separation in specific. From what? From God. Remember, God drove man from his presence back in Genesis 3, 24. So God pushed man away. And so how many, how many people are affected by this thing called death? All. If you'll back up just one more to chapter 3, look at verse 9 real quick. Verse 9 is a, is a summary of the Jew and Gentile alike. Paul says, what then are we, the we there, that pronoun, that's the Jew. Are we better than they, the Gentile? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. All under sin. And sin creates what? Death. Now, if all are under sin, and this let me let me throw this one out too as we we keep going. When you read the term Greek, or you read the term Gentile, who are we talking about? Yeah, we're Gentiles. Yeah. Everyone who is not part of God. They were all called, they were called the Gentile world. They would, it would better be said, they were the outsiders. They were the ones that's never been reconciled to God. They were known as the Greek or the Gentile. So here Paul comes to a conclusion. It doesn't matter if you're a religious Jew and it doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. What are you? You're, you're under sin. And sin creates death. Now, let's get a vivid picture of what this death looks like. Come back to chapter 1. <clears throat> chapter 1. And here he's going to be dealing with mankind in general. Verses 18 through 32. It's a general assessment of mankind. Notice where we began here in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What do you learn about God? First. He has wrath. And what is his wrath against? Ungodliness and unrighteousness. How much ungodliness and unrighteousness? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. How many have sinned? All. So all are under where? 
under the wrath of God. And in man's ungodliness and in man's unrighteousness, what does man do? We're going to look at another element of death. What does man do in their ungodliness and in their unrighteousness? What does he say in verse 18? They suppress the truth. Man's unrighteousness, man being in the state of death, has a tendency to suppress the truth. And you know what? You think God's wrath's not against that? Yeah, see, we've got to be careful where we get information from because God's wrath is against all the ungodliness, all the unrighteousness, because man in their unrighteousness and in their ungodliness they try to suppress the truth. We're going to see this play out. In fact, he says here in verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God, in, in two words, is revealed. Those are present tense. That's not something that's going to happen in the future. Is revealed. The wrath of God is revealed right now. You're going to see this play out against man. And their ungodliness and unrighteousness. Questions there? See, we're starting to open this thing up bigger from where we started. Here's why, verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. What is known about God? What did God do with man? He made himself what? Evident. God made himself evident to man that there is a God. There is someone greater. And, and a lot of people refer to him as the higher power. He's God Almighty. He's the creator. This is who he is. And so man in their ungodliness and unrighteousness are trying to suppress the truth about God God's wrath is against all the unrighteousness and ungodliness. And so he turns around here and he says, you know what? God made it evident within man there is a God. And they ought to know that. Here's how he did it. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. How did God make <coughs> himself evident to man? Let's all jump in. Okay. No. How did, by, someone said, by creation. By creation, God made it evident to man that there is a God. And he made sure that man understands that. But if you look at creation, there's two things that God made evident about himself. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and his eternal power and divine nature, actually there's three. You know what three things reveal about an invisible God? His attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. Now how in the world through creation can you and I see his invisible attributes? Give me an illustration. It all works together. There's a great attribute of God. So there's nothing out of order, right? You know, a lot of times we've got quite a few people in here that like to take pictures. Why? Why do you like to take pictures, especially of nature? Isn't some of it awe-inspiring? And just look at it and you just go, wow. 
an attribute of God was just revealed. And, and, and yes, go ahead. Well, the question is, that Diane asked, how would they know the attributes of God just looking through creation? Well, they, they never heard about God. They never heard about God. Yeah, how would they know? Okay? A lot of times you get to these, uh, these uh, human tribes. They worship the sun god. They know something about the sun. They know something about the moon. They know something about rain and seasons. There's attributes being, being spoken just through that. Now, they may, they may say, well, we'll make a God to this. But God's attributes are seen. The consistency, it's there. Okay? Does that answer you? All right. Uh, notice as he talks about his eternal power. How can we see through creation? The eternal power of an, of an invisible God. Because things continue to grow. You what? Things continue to grow. Things continue to grow. Are there some power from nothing, from a little seed? Yeah. Any other way? His eternal power. He takes care of animals. Takes care of animals. There you go. There's another one. What did someone else say? A what? Life and death. Life and death. Ooh, there's some power. We want everybody to evacuate the island immediately. There's a hurricane coming. A few years ago when we got struck by a tornado, what did everybody do? I mean, we were all struck. We were like, whoa, this was bad, you know. Hey, there's someone greater than you in charge of this world. And his invisible attributes, his eternal power can be seen through hurricanes, through tornadoes, through volcanoes, through earthquakes. I mean, there are some visible attributes of God that's not happening. And man's afraid of it. Man flees. Throw this one at you. Talk about his attributes and his eternal power. If you watched any, any news, I don't care if you read it or where, everybody knew about the Buffalo Bill player that died on the field. Remember that? It was all over the place. And immediately when they had to come out, they canceled the game. They came out. They had to Get his heart started back again. And what did you see all the players do? They got down and prayed. The very ones who want to kick God out of everything. And now at the most important time, and it comes back to your point, life and death. At the most important time, what are we doing? We're praying. Who are you praying to? You're not just yipping up somewhere. Isn't it amazing how God's eternal power can be seen through creation and there is creation of man. You know, many of us remember back when the Twin Towers were stuck or were struck by planes. What did this country do? The country that wants God out of everything. What happened to us? They said church attendance doubled. People were praying. People were... This attributes, this power of God is seen. We need your help. This is bigger than us. My wrath is against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And you keep suppressing my truth and unrighteousness... <laughs> Well, I made it evident to man that there is a God that I rule. And you can see my eternal attributes through creation if you just open up your eyes 
and you'll see the attributes of how I keep things consistent. You will see my eternal power. I've got the ability to change and just take everything down. I can do it. And then he talks about his divine nature. Can you give me an illustration of the divine nature of God? The divine nature. Here's your one. He cannot lie. Yeah, but how's man going to learn that through creation? I'll give you one. Every morning, and hunters know this, in hunting season, every morning in the east at a specific time, what happens? And every evening at a specific time, what happens? We got the sun coming up and we got the sun going down. And has it ever failed you? Look at here. The divine nature of God. You can count on him. You can always count on him. In Genesis chapter 8, in verse 22, we read, As long as the earth remains, there will be summer and winter, spring and fall. All these people running around with the climate change stuff, you know what God said? As long as the earth remains, you will have your seasons. You will have your rain those kind of things will come there again here's the divine nature of God giving order to everything we have seasons and even in the warm climates they have seasons but what is, what is man learning has God made himself evident that there is a God ruling this world Let me show you one. Hold this for a second. Come back to the one book back to the book of Acts. I want everybody to find it. Acts chapter 14. <clears throat> Acts chapter 14. Can y'all hear me back there okay? Okay, good. Thank you. Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had come, come to a city called Lystra. And when they came to this city, uh, look down at verse 15. What, what they had done, Paul, Paul, and Barnabas, they, Paul had healed that. And they were very caught up on the gods, uh, of the Roman gods. And, and they, they began to fall down and, and they, they called uh, Paul Hermes and Barnabas was Zeus. The gods have come down to us. That's what they were crying, the city. Here's Paul's response, verse 15. And saying, men, why are you doing these things? Why are also men, excuse me, we are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's within them, verse 16. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. God allowed them. Do your own thing. Verse 17. And yet, he did not leave himself without witness. In that, he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. What is Paul to preach to these people? They believed in the God Zeus and Hermes. There is a witness. God left himself a witness. And what was the witness? All these seasons 
all these rains, all this food you grow, God left himself a witness. Man knows there's a God through creation. That doesn't mean you can come to salvation, but what it does, it lets man know that there is a God and you need to be seeking for this God that's powerful. That's who you need to go after. And that comes back to your, your comment a while ago. You know, if you just seek for him. And so coming back to Romans, he says here in verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. How does God see man? Without excuse. Every man and woman on the face of this earth is without excuse. Was Adam and Eve without excuse? But they were. They knew God. They knew God. They did not listen. And in unrighteousness, they suppressed God's truth, just like the devil did. He didn't mean it. They knew God. And so God sees them without excuse. Remember what man began to do? Eve, the first thing she did, she blamed the serpent. You remember what Adam began to do? He began to blame God and he began to blame Eve. I mean, it's all blame. It's everybody else's fault. And God said, no, I'm telling you, we'll start with the serpent, we'll go to Eve, and we'll go to Adam. Cursed are all of you. Cursed is the ground. Everything because of your actions. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the godliness and unrighteousness of men. God sees people without excuse on the face of this earth. They are without excuse because God's got himself a witness. And that's his eternal power, his invisible attributes, and his divine nature. If man would just look around, this stuff didn't fall into place through some big bang. This thing was sorted, and it was created like that. Well, let's get back up to verse 21. Or go down to 21. Let's see what man does with the evidence of God. Verse 21. For even though they knew God, and that knew there is knowing about through creation. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, and they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What does man do? What did man do? He don't honor God. Man did not honor God and they didn't do what? They didn't thank him for anything. Man doesn't want to know when God's left himself with, with a witness evidence and man just goes does their own thing you don't think there's any powerful thing going on here and so god sees man without excuse and so here goes man so man just walks away and does what what do you do when you don't honor god What do you do when you give no thanks? You know, you, you can take any given first day of the week. Look at the people that want to honor God. One day God asks, would you just come honor me and praise me? You're my creation. We're marvelously made. Man doesn't want to do that. 
So when man doesn't make a response to God in verse 21, what started happening? He says there at the end of the verse. Well, even before the heart darkened, he says they became futile in their speculations. Speculations, what do you think? How you think how things work? Remember where we started this class? We started in Ephesians 2 in verse 3 where he talked about the mind that, that when you're dead in your trespasses and sins, you follow the desires of your own fleshly mind. It's an internal thing. Well, here, man starts speculating. You know, uh, you know, there's a group today that uh, you can go and you can try to get some counseling and they say you need to have a higher being and that higher being needs to be whoever you want it to be. If it's a doorknob, that's the higher being to you. Now, how foolish is that? By the way, this is AA that does that. You make the higher being who you want it to be. You want it to be a ceiling fan? If that's the higher being to you, that's acceptable. Wrath of God's against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Try to suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. He's a doorknob? The creation of man? He's a fan? He's a light? He's whatever you want him to be? The creation of man? Now, why do you think people are in trouble? Yes, sir. I don't want to get you off track. But You're not. How with all this evidence that we have of creation, how do atheists, atheists, where do they get their, their belief? They, the, most atheists, and the question is Mike's asking, is how did atheists get their belief? Um, that you ask that, first off, first off, they, they don't believe, they, they believe the Big Bang Theory. They believe evolution. That's what they do. I'll share this one. That, that reminded me of one. I had an agnostic, which was not quite as far as an atheist, but they're just as bad. The fellow was an agnostic. He's in his mid-30s. He came into my office recently, <coughs> sat down with me, and he said, I want you to prove to me there's a God. That was his question to me. So I said, I know it's not proper to ask a question with a question, but I, I want to in this case, if you would permit. And he said, sure. I said, prove to me there's not. He said, I can prove it right here on the spot. I said, okay. And he looked up at the ceiling in my office and he raised his hands and he said, if there's a God of heaven and earth that created all this, strike me dead right now. It scared the tar out of me. I'm just going to tell you. I'd never heard anybody do it. And then he raised his voice louder. And he said, if there's a God, I beg of you, strike me this very instant. And he sat there with his arms up doing this. Dropped his arms and looked at me and he said, there is no God. And I said, have you ever thought God just now showed you mercy? And he said, no, no, there's no God. Next week he was in the hospital fighting for his life. And I thought of that. I've not got to talk to him since. But it, what are we doing? How far off are we? How far into death are people? God sees man without excuse. And in man's thinking and their speculations, they become futile. They're, they're empty. They're not going anywhere. And then he says, and their foolish heart was darkened. I mean, when you start internally, when things start happening, and your old heart gets dark, what's happening to you? You're going down a wrong path real quick. And you think you're smart. Well, let's look at the next verse. Look at verse 22. Yes. What chapter are you in? 
chapter 1, Romans 1. Romans 1. Look at verse 22. And by the way, if you talk about speculations and your foolish heart darkened, is man getting better in time or worse when you're dead? Getting worse. Look at verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. What does man profess? Oh, everybody's smart. We got all these doctors and these brilliant people and chemists and scientists. Uh, we're wise. But what does God say to the king? Fools. Now I'll share this one with you. See that word fool? That Greek word fool, we get our English word <laughs> moron. It's moronic. That's where our English word comes from. Moron. I mean, you're thinking you're so smart, you're so wise, and you're out doodling God, and you're so far ahead of him, and you can take care of it yourself. Hey, God said, yeah, not only your foolish hearts dark, and you became moron. Moron. This is moronic. I'm trying to be careful how I say it, but I'm going to just say it. I think I'm a woman. <laughs> now, what's going on in our society? I feel like I'm a woman. I feel like I'm a man from a woman. And then it topped it off. A fellow the other day was talking on the radio and he said his husband back home was about to give birth to a baby. This transgender stuff. We're going to see it just in, not this week, but coming next week, I'll show you why it's so wrong. God created them, male and female, he said back in Genesis 2. That's what he created them. But man, forget God. Forget there's a God who rules the world. Forget all of that. Let's just get our thinking off, off guard. Let's get it futile in our speculations. Let's just get darkened in our heart. Let's just go to the point that we're just so smart that you're a moron. And God says that's not right. I did not create that. I did not create it. And now we're seeing. You're taking a good look right here this morning. This is what death looks like. I want you to see that. We're looking at spiritual death. The whole mind thinking is off. The whole approach to life, it's off. The heart has gone astray. Your whole reasonings and things, you're, it's just so foolish. And God said, I am in control. And let me just bring one big storm to you, and I can show you I rule. But you better start seeking all right, questions or comments are there. So I kind of have something to go hand in hand with that because sure. Sophia and I had this conversation because all kids want to think they're one way or another. I think they all question right. their gender and who they are and what they are. Right. And so Sophia had gone through this, I'm a boy stage. I'm like, baby, you're not a boy. We talk about it here and there. She's like, mommy, I'm a boy. I'm like, you're a girl. She says, no, mommy, I'm a boy. So finally one day I'm like, well, baby, you can't be a boy. She's like, why, why not, mom? God gave you the organs to be a girl. You can think you're a boy, but God gave you those organs. And so then after that, never again. She was like, okay. So I think sometimes we just lack guidance and understanding, and we're so worried about not hurting anybody's feelings that we forget about guiding them with love and helping them to understand reality versus um, 
we have to tell them how they are instead of guiding them with that love aspect. And that's why you're a parent. And that's why you're a parent that loves the Lord. Because I'm not going to let the world suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. We want to come to God on His terms. Only His terms. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, this is the kind of stuff that comes out. And we got more and more parents that aren't teaching their children very little about God because the parents don't know about God. So what happens when a fool teaches a fool? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And that's, I'm afraid, is what's happening in yes. our Yes. They've and, rejected it so long. And we're going to get to verse 28. I know. We we're going to get there. But Judy makes a great point that God's going to give you the kind of mind you want, the kind of heart. Uh, God's going to give you whatever you want. If you don't want to honor God as God, if you don't want to listen to Him and do it His way, then you know what? I'll give you what you want. You'll get some depravity out of this thing. And you think you're okay. That's the scary part. That is the scary part. It's the same thing there in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 12, where he talks about you stop seeking the truth, God's going to give you an influence to believe a lie. And don't you think God won't do it? There's, there's the power of God. You don't want truth. You want a lie. So I will help you find a lie. And you can't blame me for it. Because that's what you sought for the whole way. And that's what God's doing. So we're taking a good look at spiritual death. And this is what spiritual death looks like. And everybody's so smart. They think they're so wise. And they go and they do their own life their own way without any consideration for what God wants, that's a fool. And death reigns over them, and they don't even know it. Okay, we'll continue this next week. Thank you so much. Appreciate the comments.